OK, this presentation will cover the events that led to the major wildfires in Northern California, uh, the response to them and their aftermath. So let's go ahead and just get started with that. Uh, in the late night of 15 September, the early morning of 16 September, we had an unusual dry thunderstorm pass through that had more than 12,000 lightning strikes occur across the region. Uh, as you all know, this is really uncommon. <laughs> for our area. And, uh, and in doing uh, research for this presentation, I found online where many people recorded images and video of this event. And, and so you can find some really amazing images uh, of that night online. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, this weather pattern occurred during a period of hot and dry conditions that increased uh, the fire risk. Uh, it wasn't surprising then that fires ignited as a result. More than 560 fires started across the state. Fortunately, in our area, winds were light during this time, limiting the initial spread of the fires. Uh, the map on this chart uh, shows the lightning strikes in our area. You see both positive lightning flashes, the red pluses, and negative lightning flashes, the blue pluses. Uh, did you know that less than 5 to 10 percent of lightning strikes are positive? The rest are negative. Uh, positive lightning carries as much, uh, carries a much greater charge and a longer flash duration than negative lightning reaching up to 1 billion volts and 300,000 amps compared with 300 million volts and 30,000 amps with a negative lightning. So does this mean that a positive lightning strike is more risky than a negative strike? Uh, the National Weather Service reports that positive flashes are believed to be responsible for a large percentage of forest fires and power line damage. Uh, let me jump ahead about a week to show you what California was facing seven days into this ordeal. Of the over 500 fires that had started, many, if not most, had been contained or extinguished. Uh, by this time, uh, seven days later, 12,000 firefighters are now battling two dozen major fires that had already burned 770,000 acres. And in Northern California, firefighters had their hands full with four major fire complexes and one large fire in Monterey County as shown on the uh, on, on the map, uh, uh, the upper map on this slide. Now, a fire complex is two or more individual incidents located in the same general area which are assigned to a single incident commander or unified command. Fighting these fires as complexes allowed the unified command team to be more strategic in their response. Uh, and while I'm here, let me provide a little word about air quality. Uh, we had a number of inquiries in the office about the smoke in and around Palo Alto during this time period. Most of the time, our poor air quality was a result of the wind bringing the smoke from the North Bay fires, the ones farther up north, down to the peninsula. In the summer, winds are predominantly from the northwest to the southeast, which means that smoke from the fires burning to the north will impact our air quality more than the fires burning to the east or to the west of us. Now, that being said, with so much fire, with, with so much smoke in the air from the the size of these fires uh, the, uh, and the shift throughout the day of local wind patterns, we were also getting smoke from the Santa Cruz and East Bay fires. Uh, the satellite image on this slide, uh, the bottom image, shows the prevailing winds during this time and how the smoke was moving generally northwest to southeast. And I'll just highlight that the, uh, the this fire here that was part of the uh, August uh, complex uh, which was in and around Guerneville, actually produced a lot of smoke that we ended up getting down here in the uh, in the bay. Uh, so the two local complexes that we had on either side of us to the east and to the west were the CZU fire and the SCU fire. Now, first of all, you may be wondering how these fires were named. Uh, in this case, they were named for the Cal Fire units nearest the fires. So the CZU is the uh, abbreviation for the Santa Cruz San Mateo Cal Fire Unit, and SCU is the abbreviation for the Santa Clara Cal Fire Unit. Uh, so that's how they got their names. I always had a hard time keeping the two acronyms straight, so I, I tended to call them the Santa Cruz Fire and the East Bay Fire uh, to more easily remind myself where these fires were. Uh, because so many fires started all at once, fire agencies were challenged to get to them all, and some fires started in locations where ground crews could not even gain access. Crews were already fighting fires in other parts of the state. Uh, Palo Alto had already provided a, a, a crew to, uh, to another fire, 
so there were not enough resources available. Some of the fires were left to burn for several days before any work, any resources could get to them. Uh, and it took time to build the capacity to get sufficient numbers of firefighting resources. And even then it wasn't always enough, but in some cases all that was available. So of course, mutual aid was heavily used. We had local mutual aid, regional, uh, state resources, including the National Guard were used. Crews from out of state came in and assisted. Uh, federal resources were also employed. So there were a massive number of resources that were being uh, that, that were being dedicated to these large fires that kept getting bigger and bigger as time went on. Uh, as a result, evacuations became inevitable. Uh, the first evacuations in Santa Cruz County started the evening of 18 August, two days after the fire started, uh, when it became obvious that the fire could not be contained and those areas protected. Uh, the SCU fire, the East Bay fire, had evacuations in other counties earlier than in Santa Clara County. As a reminder, the SCU fire, as you can see on the map on the right-hand side of the screen, encompassed five counties. So uh, on the uh, 23rd of August, uh, several thousand had to evacuate the Morgan Hill neighborhood of Holiday Lakes Estate. Uh, a quick note on these maps. Uh, the uh, CZU fire here, uh, you can see the uh, fire perimeter use of, uh, right here. And the red area all around is the area that is uh, that was called for evacuations, uh, the areas that, that had uh, mandatory evacuation orders. Uh, similar to the East Bay fire, uh, we can see the, the the different fire perimeters here and the areas that were evacuated. Okay, I'm going to jump to uh, evacuation procedures and how the county ran their evacuation procedures. Um, in Santa Clara County, uh, based on the Lightning Complex incident, evacuations were controlled and coordinated by the Unified Command Team. As a reminder, when a response involves multi-agency or multi-jurisdictional approach, the incident command leadership of the response effort expands into a unified command. The unified command is a structure that brings together the incident commander of the major organizations involved in the incident in order to coordinate an effective response while at the same time allowing each to carry out their own jurisdictional, legal, and functional responsibilities. Wildland fire situations often use unified command structures because of the complexity of jurisdiction and uh, agencies that are involved in them. Uh, the unified command team in this case, CAL FIRE and the, and the county sheriffs, uh, depending on which counties were impacted, uh, with cooperating agencies identified the areas at risk and which areas should be evacuated. Uh, so, you know, based on the situation that we see, we can identify where the fire is moving, what areas are going to be threatened, what areas we can defend, therefore what areas uh, need to be evacuated. Uh, the county sheriff then, or the local law enforcement agency, has the authority to order and enforce evacuations. Uh, these evacuation orders are then disseminated through mass notification systems, social media, and local news media sources, among other uh, methods. So in Santa Clara County, Alert SEC was used as the primary notification mechanism, and these were sent by the Santa Clara County 911 Communications Department for all evacuation warnings and orders for the CSU fire and the CZU fire for the areas of Santa Clara County that were impacted. Uh, this is why we are continually urging our community to sign up for Alert SEC. And the uh, our, our local stay informed link there is on the slide here city of palo alto.org slash stay informed uh, you can find uh, information for signing up for alert sec as well as signing up for our own city of palo alto social media connections okay and annette i see you have your hand up but if you'll give me uh, another slide or two uh, we'll get to comments and questions no okay, i don't so have my hand up, my hand up. Oh, OK. Uh, Andrea, can you take care of that for me, please? So what does an evacuation order look like? Uh, this is an example from the CZU incident, the Santa Cruz incident. Uh, this same information is used to create the alert SEC notification that uh, would go out via text, email and telephone. So it states that it is an evacuation order. It could also be an evacuation warning uh, if, if necessary. It 
states the time that the evacuation order is effective, what areas are to be evacuated, uh, and this uses uh, pre-identified, in, in this case, for the Santa Cruz fire, uh, they were able to use pre-identified zones, evacuation zones, that correspond to geographic locations. Uh, this is a little bit different than what happened in the CSU fire, the Santa, the, uh, uh, the East Bay fire, because it encompassed so many different counties, there was not a pre-identified evacuation zone scheme, so they were coming up with the geographic locations and zones on the fly. Uh, so the order also describes, if necessary, what areas zones are under an evacuation warning. Uh, so in this case, uh, it it mentions when an evacuation warning is, is used, but it doesn't mention that in this particular order. And it also identifies the location of evacuation centers, also called temporary evacuation points, uh, which are locations that serve as a temporary place to evacuate when a disaster or large scale incident strikes. It does not include overnight stays. Overnight stays usually involve emergency shelters. So when we do evacuate people, uh, we know we'll probably need to establish shelters. Uh, so what did shelter operations look like for these fires? Uh, in the SCU complex, the County EOC Care and Shelter Unit, uh, let, me re let me say that again, in the SCU complex, so the East Bay Fire, the Santa Clara County EOC Emergency Operations Center Care and Shelter Unit, which was staffed by the County Social Services Agency and supported by the County's Office of Supportive Housing, managed the establishment of three temporary evacuation points, also called evacuation centers, uh, one in Morgan Hill, uh, at the Morgan Hill High School, one at the Milpitas Library, and one at uh, Cupertino Community Center, where evacuees were sent from there to specific hotels that were set up by the uh, Social Services Agency, and fortunately, in this case, paid for by the Red Cross. In the Santa Cruz complex, because evacuation started earlier and sort of more organically, um, the, uh, the local jurisdiction started with traditional congregate shelters, so your typical emergency shelters, at three locations to support sheltering, but uh, into the response, we're able to establish a hotel-based program as well. Uh, we saw in both fires that the vast majority of people who evacuated did not use these shelter opportunities, but instead found their own accommodations. Uh, in all of our training and our education that we do in our outreach, we always recommend for people to think about what happens if I have to evacuate, where am I gonna go? We always tell people that going to an emergency shelter should be your last course of action uh, because it will be the hardest and most uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so what we usually see is that low percentages of people uh, make their way to these shelters. Uh, hotels were used as a way to manage the COVID related individual safety measures and likely because the Red Cross knew that number one, small numbers would seek shelters. And number two, the Red Cross was also reducing the occupancy at shelters due to COVID-19 uh, so that shelter so that shelter, shelter agents can be further apart from one another, uh, it would take more shelters uh, to house people and, and hotels become a much easier option if the funding exists. Uh, and in this case, uh, the Red Cross was able to obtain funding for these, uh, these, these hotel, uh, hotel programs for the evacuees. Okay, so um, what what happened? What were the results of these incidents? Uh, so I'll kind of go by the numbers. On the Santa Cruz fire, uh, evacuation orders started to lift on 27 August. Uh, so we started evacuations on the 18th of August. We started to lift the initial evacuation orders on the 27th of August and continued to phase these evacuations based on the areas that could be cleared safely for repopulation. <laughs> the repopulation effort took weeks. Um, as of 16 September, some zones were still not repopulated. 920 people were under evacuation orders and the fire was 93% uh, contained. You can see that even though 86,000 acres were burned, uh, over 1,500 structures were destroyed. There was one civilian death and 2,000 firefighters um, ended up working on that, on that incident at one time. Uh, and you can contrast that with the East Bay fire, the SCU fire. Uh, evacuation orders started to lift on the 26th of August. 
uh, but those were also phased evacuations, uh, I'm sorry, phased uh, repopulation of the areas based on the what, what areas were safe to go back to. And again, repopulation took weeks. Uh, however, in this case, by 5 September, all Santa Clara County evacuation orders had been lifted. And by 16 September, and by 16 September, 98% of the fire was contained. Uh, you can see that even though this fire burned a much larger area, only a few, you know, relatively few structures were uh, were destroyed. Uh, and uh, this is in Santa Clara County, if I'm not mistaken, 936 structures in Santa Clara County that were destroyed, uh, mainly because this is really rural countryside uh, and pasture lands uh, that 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 burned. Uh, versus a, a more dense uh, residential area in the uh, in the CZU Santa Cruz fire. So th that's kind of what's happening locally. Uh, and then Chief Blackshire, uh, could you put this into perspective for us in terms of you know what what this means for California in in general? Let me get off your mute now. now. Yes. Good. Good. <laughs> So yeah, just to put it into perspective, um, you know, and to talk more about numbers, and because that's the best way we can put this into context, is that we know that <clears throat> since the beginning of the year, there have been over 8,000 wildfires that have burned over 3.6 million acres in California, and that's larger than the size of the state of Connecticut. Since August 15th, when California's fires <laughs> were elevated, there's been 26 fatalities and over 6,600 structures that were destroyed. And right now we have the state has over 18,000 firefighters on the front lines. And right now there's two dozen major wildfires burning, not including the 22 new initial attack wildfires that sparked yesterday across the state. And so if you look at the graph that Nathan has on this slide, and it talks about or it displays the top 20 largest California wildfires um, and you know, these the, the term that's coined for the current fire situation that I don't think is spoke of enough are mega fires because, you know, we we've taken California has taken wildfires to a whole nother level. And so when you're reading articles on fire or watching it on the news, you'll uh, you often hear them to refer to as mega fires. And so of these fires, top 10 all occurred in the last seven years. And the six of the top 20 largest mega fires in California history occurred this year. And so um, the situation is not getting any better, which means that our pre uh, our preparedness needs to heighten as well. Fire season is getting longer and more destructive. And uh, as you know, our um, neighboring state in Oregon has about 1 million acres that have burned this year, which is double their 10 year average. And so we really need to, you know, the more information we can give better and the more preparedness we can uh, we can initiate is better. So that just to give you a context of the direction that we're going and how how, how we're affected by these mega fires. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gio, for uh, for for that. Um, so let's see, let me go ahead and move on. Um, so what about us? What about Palo Alto? Uh, well, the closest that we came to a serious impact uh, was on the 23rd, 24th of August. Uh, so this is about, you know, a little more than a week after the uh, the, the initial lightning strikes uh, had occurred. The National Weather for uh, the National Weather Service forecasted another dry thunderstorm system would move through the area and potentially bring more lightning uh, on the night of 23 August through the 24th of August. And as a result, Cal Fire issued uh, Cal Fire and uh, the the, uh, the, the CCU Unified Command Team issued an evacuation warning to select areas of Santa Clara County side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, that area is highlighted in yellow on the left hand map. Uh, the area in bold is the portion within the Palo Alto jurisdiction and includes those properties from Skyline Road to Foothills Park. The evacuation warning was sent as a precaution for predicted fire weather, not for fires that were already burning. Uh, because we, uh, the city, was involved in daily coordination calls with the county EOC team, uh, we knew an evacuation warning would be issued Sunday night, uh, that, the night of the 23rd of August. But we didn't know what specific areas would be under this warning. 
So uh, we had our city public information officer push out notifications across our social media platforms that the evacuation warning was coming. Uh, but due to the limited scope of the warning area, only a small number of the Foothills residents received the alert SEC notifications. And again, those that were in that that yellow um, yellow zone that you see on the map. So what we didn't know uh, until about this time was that the Santa Clara County Fire uh, Services had recently developed uh, evacuation zones in the Santa Clara County foothills, similar to what had been done in San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. Uh, and this is also now demonstrated on the right hand map. Uh, these were the zones that were used for the evacuation warning set on 23 August. Uh, so the the yellow bolded zone on the left hand side uh, corresponds to the some of the zones on the right hand side. So if I were to start from the south and go to the north on this map, uh, zone PA E008 06 1 and 2. And so those uh, this is a new scheme that we're just now uh, able to start using. Uh, and this is advantage. Uh, this is advantageous to us because with this zone scheme, we can now more clear, clearly designate the specific areas to be warned and evacuated in the future, and educate the uh, the foothills residents of this uh, this scheme as well. Uh, while the smoky conditions during this time made it feel like the fires were on top of us, our jurisdiction was never really directly threatened. OK, and so we want to talk just to uh, take a couple minutes to talk a little bit more about what was going on in the city. Uh, what were some of the city's operations? So, Gio, if I could, uh, Chief Blackshaw, if I could get you to come back and talk about what Palo Alto Fire was uh, was contributing to to these responses. Sure, so um, so as everyone knows or may know that every agency in the state country for that matter has limited resources. And fortunately, the state has a wonderful mutual aid, master mutual aid system in place, which allows resources all over the state to aid other jurisdictions in a time of crisis or a disaster. And uh, we are part of the master mutual aid system, and uh, we were able to contribute resources to uh, several fires this year. Um, we've had uh, fire units at the River Fire in Monterey County, We've had fire units at the SCU fire. We've had fire units at the LNU fire. And we had uh, we have currently have a fire engine at the Creek fire, which is out in Fresno County. And also we have units at the uh, North North fire complex, which is over in Plumas and Butte County. And so um, that's our contribution to the mutual aid system. As you saw in the previous slide that Nathan showed that, um, you know, the uh, CZU fire alone had 2000 firefighters and that's just one fire across the state. And so as much as we benefit from having these resources available, what happens is those resources can become scarce as the need increases and therefore uh, the operation can be as successful as we like. But um, you know, it's important that we provide aid to our neighboring jurisdictions, even across the state, and in hopes that, and with hopes that if and when uh, tragedy comes to Palo Alto, that we would receive the same level of uh, service from the state mutual aid um, partners. And uh, it's not just limited to fire, mutual aid is also includes law enforcement, ambulances, uh, utility resources, but um, I think uh, Ken Duker. Uh, may want to chime in on that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chief Blackshire, and uh, thanks everybody for being here this evening for this talk. So, as Chief Blackshire alluded to, there is a statewide system for public safety mutual aid, as as well as some other resources. It's generally administered by state OES, known as Cal OES. So. Um, we're going to keep this kind of short tonight, but uh, just as we have in our emergency services volunteer system, the idea that if one neighborhood is more or less OK and everything's good, you could release resources out of your neighborhood and they could go through our 
city in, inter, internal city process that is very much analogous to how it works uh, statewide and then there's uh, there are actually some other uh, compacts that allow uh, resources from other states in the United States and even other foreign countries to come in and assist especially with these uh, larger scale disasters such as what we're doing now so back to you chief lecture So I, uh, Gio, I'll, I'll take it from there. Uh, hey, Ken, can you just quickly talk about what other, uh, you, you know, what, what was happening in terms of our city communications and interagency coordination during this time to, to keep, sure, uh, to, to, to keep the community engaged? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously communication with the, uh, with the public at large, uh, and obviously you as ESV saw some targeted specific uh, communication from us in OES, but I won't belabor that since you all saw it. Um, just to answer Dan Mellick's uh, question in the chat, uh, the MIOC did not get deployed so far. I'm knocking wood as I sit here in the MIOC. Uh, it could certainly be deployed if we saw uh, other large campaign fires where you needed a command and control or communications resource such as this. What did get deployed to segue Dan's question to what Nathan just asked uh, is my vehicle and yours truly. So part of what we were doing in the initial stage is trying to quite literally gain situational awareness. So a fancy term for us trying to figure out what's going on in our, in our area. Uh, Chief Blackshaw used some specific terms uh, as did Nathan about unified command fancy way of saying that we've got a bunch of different agencies and different disciplines in this case working together to do really three things figure out what is the current condition set of conditions that we're dealing with what actions are we taking and what are our needs near term and longer term so that's known as can conditions and actions needs and based on the the uh, output of that implicit in that uh, which becomes explicit when we go to the PIO the public information officer function we needed to communicate broadly with uh, the, the general public, as I said, and also uh, those entities, including non-government ones, that might have a role to play or be specifically impacted. For example, Stanford Hospital, the school district, and so forth. Now, the good news is we already were in the midst of at least one disaster, which was the pandemic. So a lot of these structures were set up. As Nathan said, even he and, and others who are in the business had a little bit of confusion about, um, well, what what is the CZU, right? That's a CAL FIRE uh, designator for a, ge a geographic division, essentially, it's a unit. And so that's all of Santa Clara, or sorry, all of Santa Cruz County and all of San Mateo County and none of, uh, of our county. And yet that was the primary driver of what was going on with where we needed to communicate. So the ways, the ways that uh, information got communicated to us in the Emergency Operations Center and uh, ultimately through our PIOs was through the existing best practices and mechanisms that were set up. I won't bore you with all the acronyms such as JIC or JIS, but if you want to look up Joint Information Center, um, there's plenty of good stuff being put out, really led by CAL FIRE as the primary agency, even though it was a unified event, still is. They are they're the, the, the big driver of it, and they have a very sophisticated way of getting information out to the public. Um, I would also add that there is a lot of less formal ways that uh, the involved and helping agencies coordinated uh, primarily through the Emergency Operations Center of our county of Santa Clara County, where we had regular phone calls. In addition to, I'll say, less formal means such as Chief Blackshire being on the county fire chief's phone calls on this subject. So that's really the high level lay of it um, to the to the chat for those of you reading the chat. Um, hey Ken, I'll take Ken, I'll take I'll, Ken, I'll take care of the chat in a minute. So you know, just, I'll, I'll let you just, just talk about where people can see some of the uh, the Cal Fire Twitter feed, for example, and some of the other bits. Uh, yeah, so I'll let you take it, Nathan, and I'll, I'll circle back if we have further questions. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, Okay, so that, that's kind of a, a quick synopsis of, of things that were happening around the city. I hope that you were all able to take advantage of the, 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 the information that our communications team was pushing out about the fire. Um, if you were to, uh, to, to, to look on the city's website, 
you know, we had this uh, regional fire status and online resources. Uh, and I've, I've sort of taken a snapshot of what that looks like on the website. And so that was active and being populated daily. Um, our PIO team team does a really great job of uh, uh, keeping keeping uh, keeping us in the community informed. Uh, Alright, so moving on, uh, one of the final things that we wanted to cover tonight was just the topic of being prepared. Um, and so we recommend those who live in the wildland urban interface, we usually call that the WUI, uh, follow CAL FIRE's Ready, Set, Go program, uh, which is available on the city's wildfire page, uh, cityofpaloalto.org wildfire. I see some chats in there that uh, somebody didn't wasn't able to get to that. Uh, but that's the link, so you may look at your your browser and make sure you're typing in the right the the right link there, uh, cityofpaloalto.org/wildfire, uh, and we've got all of Cal Fire's um, preparedness materials there and e e easy to find and hopefully easy to 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 uh, to digest um, uh, manner. Uh, and in our area, you are in the WUI, you're in the Wildland Urban Interface. Generally speaking, if you live west of Interstate 280. OK, so everybody that lives west of Interstate 280 is considered in the WUI. Those of us that live on the east of 280, we're not in the WUI and we're not as uh, at a uh, at, at the same level of threat as those who who are uh, on the other side of the interstate. Um, so as a reminder, you know, being ready to go uh, means being ready for for the wildfire way before there is a threat of a wildfire, and it really involves maintaining adequate defensible space and hardening your home by using fire resistant building materials. Again, lots of information about that on the website. Uh, being set uh, means preparing yourself and your home for the possibility of having to evacuate. There are three main steps to take. Uh, one is creating a, an, an action plan, right? We talk a lot about creating an emergency plan. Uh, there's a specific wildfire action plan that, that you, uh, some, uh, a planning process that you should go through if you live in the WUI. Uh, you should assemble an emergency supply kit for each person in your household and fill out a family communication plan that includes important evacuation and contact information. I will note a lot of these are similar to the to the same preparedness steps that we put out to the community at large uh, for for our, our our all hazards matrix, but there are some very special considerations for the wildfire planning that should be uh, looked at in detail in this get set uh, step and then go uh, when an immediate evacuation is necessary uh, you you have to be ready to go uh, you want to review your emergency plan checklist ensure your emergency supply kit is in your vehicle and then you want to take some protective actions uh, to to be protected against the heat and potential embers during your evacuation if you didn't evacuate early um, one of the things that we'll always recommend is that you evacuate early uh, before, whenever possible, it, it becomes mandatory. Uh, only because we we know that the the routes in and around the Palo Alto foothills, the the Santa Cruz mountains, are limited. Uh, a number of people are going to be trying to evacuate at the same time, and we we just can't control the fire. And unfortunately, in some instances, people wait too late to evacuate, and and they don't make it out. Okay, so follow those steps. Ready, set, go. Um, located at the uh, paloalto.org uh, wildfire site. Um, so uh, Chief Blackshaw, are there any final thoughts about preparedness uh, and, and you know wildfire preparedness that you want to impart to the uh, participants tonight? Sure, yeah, I'd like to leave a couple uh, just thoughts to think about um, before we depart and go into our Q&A. So um, generally speaking, California is designed to burn. And we have to accept that uh, all these fires were not set by they're not caused by humans. Uh, the thousands of lightning uh, strikes caused a lot of these fires that are going right now, and that's just the way it's made. It, it California's designed to burn, and people that live in the wildland in, urban interface are in the fire environment. That's just the facts, and the fuel is very dry stricken right now, which is why everything caught fire so easily with these lightning strikes and now we have these mega fires the gravity of the situation is really it leaves no room for error when it comes to our response but we're human but that's just the gravity of it so we really have to be effective and 
as you heard, and I'll refer to the CZU fire, there were 2,000 firefighters on that fire, and we have very little control over it. We have no control over these lightning strikes. Uh, sometimes these fires will take uh, days and days upon end to present itself and let alone get access to it to really fight this fire before it becomes uncontrollable. But the one thing that we do have control over is evacuation. That's the one thing when regards to wildfires that we have complete control over is evacuation. And so you don't want to wait until that fire is licking on your back door to evacuate. Uh, if residents are waiting for fire season to prepare for to, waiting for fire season to prepare for fire season, that's too late. Preparedness is an ongoing maintenance concept, just like you would maintain your lawn or your pool or your car. You can't just wait till it breaks down to fix it. You have to maintain these things so they're functional. So your preparedness has to be maintained throughout the year. And so you're always prepared. Um, so being prepared is signing up for these alerting systems. Um, being a good neighbor, check with your neighbor and see if they're signed up. Uh, is your go bag ready to go? Do you have your evacuation route in place or your place of refuge? Do you know, uh, you know, are you ready to to access those places should something happen? Are you maintaining your defensible space, which is uh, it's California law? It's a public records code 4291 that says that people in the wildland urban interface have to maintain this defensible space and we expect civilians to be lawful every day. Uh, so what I want to get across is for people to heed the warning because the 26 fatalities this year are real. The 6,000 plus structures that were destroyed this year are real. We currently have two firefighters that are deployed with FEMA Task Force 3 to the North Complex fire right now to do rescue and recovery because there are people missing. So they are sent out there to find these people that are missing, which um, hopefully not, but may likely be dead. Um, the firefighters priority is to save lives and if you can evacuate soon enough and be prepared, you eliminate that risk because we'll put our lives at risk to save your life. If we know that your place is evacuated, we can focus on the structure and keep ourselves safer because we don't want we could focus on your home in the perimeter of the fire because we will not trade a firefighter's life for a structure. But we know that good luck begets bad habits and don't think that it can't happen here in Palo Alto. And we don't want to say, well, we've made it past this fire season, so it, it'll probably never happen. What we want to do is say when it happens, we're prepared and we were ready to go. So I can't put enough emphasis on the concept of ready, set, go. Don't wait till fire season to be ready, set. And, uh, you know, again, be a good neighbor and be lawful and you're really being part of the solution and collectively as first responders and citizens, we can really do this community some good. That's it. OK, uh, thank you, Gio. And so with that, we're going to go ahead and ask, uh, just jump right into our to our Q&A. Uh, I'll moderate this and Gio, uh, first question goes to you. Um, how much danger is there of new burns in the CZU area? Is the flammable flammable material all gone? So we have a, um, a decade or two. Well, you know, what, what, what do we think the, the situation is over there in, in the CZU area? So, you know, it's uh, quite a bit of uh, area burned, um, a lot of fuel, heavy fuel, heavy timber burned. Um, with defensive efforts and suppression efforts from the firefighters, we were actually uh, able to put a perimeter around there and save not only the structures, but a lot of the vegetation around there. But uh, as of August, the, the fuel level dryness is usually what it is in October. And so where I can't necessarily say that how, what the level of threat is, I could definitely say that any remaining timber or, or vegetation is still ready to burn. Right, okay, I think that's a, that, that's a fair answer. Um, certainly uh, areas that, that did burn uh, probably are at a lower risk of uh, re, you know, reigniting, reburning again, right. but there's still a huge chunk of land that didn't burn uh, that we still need to be cautious of. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and let's see the uh, the next comment or question: uh, Were any of our Aries races 
uh, personnel involved. So if you don't know what Aries Races is, that's Amateur Radio Emergency Services. So think ham radio personnel. Uh, and so no, uh, not uh, in Palo Alto, uh, Dan, this is a question from Dan Malik. None of our Aries Races members were involved. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think at even at the county level, I don't recall the county activated their uh, their amateur radio personnel, uh, and I don't know the the level to which uh, amateur radio operators were involved uh, in the CZU fire. Um, there there may be some uh, some uh, some some local stories that come out about that. So if I if I hear that, I'll I'll pass it on. Um, so I see some folks were were having trouble for some reason getting to the uh, city of Palo Alto.org wildfire. Uh, some people provided the link, so thank you very much, folks out there, for uh, giving us the uh, the sharing the the full link. Uh, Annette had a comment. We need a better method to inform people. Uh, maybe VOG, the city link was not well pushed out. Um, Ken, uh, do you want to you want to you have any thoughts about that comment? Yeah, I think uh, I, I know what Annette's getting at, and I, I don't disagree. I just think it's apples and oranges. Viochi is designed to communicate, obviously, the way we use it here, only with you, with the emergency service volunteers. Um, we really have to rely on other tools that are utilized uh, by our public information officers here in the city, uh, and, and also with um, the county tools and the regional tools, such as Everbridge and Nixle. So we won't have time to go in the weeds here, uh, as noted in the chat by Derek. Uh, Viochi has certain limitations. Wouldn't I wouldn't personally want to see Viochi as the only tool uh, that we use. So what Chief Blackshire said is really important. Uh, hopefully all of you as ESVs are signed up at a minimum uh, for Alert SCC and for Nixle. Remember that uh, this, this fire scenario that we had right next to our city limit um, is a case study in, in uh, how complex notification can be. Because to Annette's point, yeah, you're signed up for all the alerts, but the, the alerts were targeted to geographies uh, that were very likely to have uh, either a warning or an evacuation order. Um, I know Mark Nadim is on the call today and there are probably some other fellow uh, to foothills area residents on this on this session so we're not going to spam uh midtown or barren park about a fire that's not even all that close to uh mark nadim's neighborhood so but yeah we'll, we'll always have more about notification and warning uh it's an ongoing topic and there are lots and lots of very smart people working on better tools that said it's always going to be imperfect because as i said during my segment one of the challenges we have in the first responder side at the at the command level is actually for us to figure out exactly what is the perimeter of the fire and what what does that mean uh, remember the rate of spread in this case was actually very very slow so one of the things i did uh, the, the first real operational night of that fire i went up to skyline at the city limit of palo alto and to my shock i could see flames um, if you've ever, ever looked at an actual forest fire in, in real life, it is A, scary, and B, very disorienting because you cannot really tell scale. So we had to rely on what the Cal Fire uh, folks were saying on the radio about how far away it was from us, even though it appeared to be very, very close because the flames were shooting several hundred feet in the air at, at certain points. So I don't know if Gio wants to add to that, but that's kind of the, the quick, quick lay of the land. Yeah, I think I'll just jump in uh, real quick, Ken, and just mention, you know, uh, to, uh, to to Annette's credit, she's always talking about belts and suspenders. You know, we at the city, we're going to use every means that we have to communicate the message to the people that need to hear it uh, when it's needed to be heard. And so uh, Alert SEC is one of the one of the you know main tools that we're going to use in a in a um, in a dire imminent situation. Uh, but we're also going to use the other standard suite of social media. And so we're, we're, we encourage you to be signed up for next door. Uh, if you're a Twitter or a Facebook user, you know, follow the city of Palo Alto on on those social media platforms, um, because we're going to be trying to get the word out. Uh, if you don't like getting being on those social media platforms, 
Uh, we have an email, just another a separate email distribution on a tool called Nixle. Those are all located on our city of Palo Alto org stay informed page. And uh, we encourage you to to, you know, to 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 follow the the the, the medium that, that you like uh, and that supports your lifestyle the best. Um, Sonia wants to know how likely is it the fire uh, would reach into Palo Alto, Palo Alto, and she mentions like Santa Rosa with everything being unprecedented this year. Uh, Gio, can you take that one? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, it was unpredictable as uh, as for many that the concept of what transpired in Santa Rosa even happened. You know, how did it move from the hills across the freeway into the suburbs, you know, into the housing across the freeway? And, um, you know, the wind is a game changer for fire. Uh, that's what really drives uh, the fire and makes, you know, uh, you may wonder why is it a red flag day when it's not 100 degrees or it may be 100 degrees, it's not a red flag day, but it can be 85 degrees with dry fuel, low humidity, and the winds are kicking and it's a game changer. So uh, because, you know, you're saying east of 280, um, again, if, there's, if the wind is strong enough or, uh, you know, a, a Santa Ana type wind, uh, came across and blew a fire. I mean, who knows how the, you know, with 80 mile per hour gusts, the fire can really be um, destructive and cross boundaries that we never, you know, thought it would go. And that's what really, when fire is spreading, it's because the wind and you have these large, this large trees and vegetation burning and you have these embers and the embers instead of falling down, which it would do with zero um, wind is now blowing and with these gusts that are going, um, you know, anywhere between 25 to 60 plus miles an hour, blowing it miles away, starting new fires. So if it were to move east of 280, it would be a wind driven fire. Right, and uh, I think I remember from when uh, Chief Nickel was here, uh, there was a lot of concern among the council uh, when the campfire occurred in the town of Paradise uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, that was a Santa Ana wind that came through and drove that fire very, very quickly. And in in the in the Bay Area down here in the in the in sort of, you know, in the peninsula of South Bay, we don't typically see those Santa Ana winds uh, like they do up in the North Bay. And so the uh, the likelihood is pretty low that a wildfire is going to blow into come down into Palo Alto. But we would never say, you know, never, you know, we're, it's exactly. it, there's always a possibility but it's but it's pretty low. Um, so if that situation occurs, uh, that's the time where we're going to be putting information out to the whole city to be prepared to be ready. Um, Sonia also asked Gio and I may I may answer this question for you. Uh, how confident our fire department feels being able to deal with the mega fire, given how their budget keeps getting cut. Um, and I remember uh, Gio was quoted uh, in the in the in the local media by saying that if you look at the CZU fire and it took 2000 firefighters to put that out, uh, Palo Alto fire, no matter if we had 200% uh, staffing, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to handle a mega fire. You know, we're always, if, if, a, if a fire like that starts to uh, encroach on Palo Alto, we're gonna need to rely on mutual aid resources, just like every other community uh, had to rely on mutual aid resources in, in fighting those fires. Uh, Geo, anything else to add on that? Um, no, that that's actually really good. The only one other thing I would add is, you know, even if depending on the number of firefighters we have and where the fire starts, it's not always possible to get access to it. So that's also a problem as well as sometimes we're looking at the fire and just can't get to it. Meanwhile, it's growing and that's that's what happened in the CZU fire is that there were fires starting that we just couldn't get to. Um, so therefore, we just have to come up with a plan on how we're going to, you know, evacuate people. Where's the perimeter? How can we stop this fire? What do we? What resources can we get in the amount of time? What's the forecast? So it's a lot of planning that goes into place. But again, thousands, yes, thousands of fi firefighters could not stop that fire um, immediately. It took uh, weeks and weeks to get that fire under control. Okay, thanks uh, for adding on, uh, mm -hmm. there, Chief Buckshire. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Nancy Peterson, um, are you aware of recent changes before the lightning strike fires in availability of homeowners insurance vis-a-vis uh, -vis mapping of possible wildfires in our immediate area? Uh, I'm going to open that up to Ken or Geo. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. 
I don't, I don't really know anything about that. I know maybe Gio can talk about how uh, wildland fires have changed statewide insurance and a lot of carriers have backed slowly away from that business, but maybe Gio's got more to add about that specifically. Yeah, yeah, I wish I knew more about that. What I can say is, you know, we really rely on the engagement of the community in, for preventative measures and preparedness. As I mentioned, there's the, um, there's the state law of uh, 4291 that's requiring people to, uh, to have that defensible space on their property. But one way that, you know, in, in, again, I'm not an insurance person, but if, if, if insurance companies really dug into this and said, we won't insure your place until this, you know, it's really going to get that 100% compliance. So we're really just relying on people to, to be, again, be lawful. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not really a, a subject matter expert on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. So let, let's consider the, these next questions part of our speed round. Uh, so uh, Bob Hendon asked, what is the fire risk for Palo Alto east of 280? Bob, I think we've already kind of talked that about, you know, it's the, the risk is low, but we, we never want to ever say that it's not a risk at all. Um, Dan Mellick is asking, why can't more planes be purchased and outfitted for firefighting in California? Uh, I, I remember reading some information from the state uh, where the state is actually doing that right now. Uh, so Dan, uh, at the state level, CAL FIRE, uh, there is a reinvestment going on in CAL FIRE right now to purchase more planes and more helicopters, more state-of-the-art helicopters for firefighting in California. Um, and you could, you know, there's 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 probably some uh, information out there on the web that you could Google and, and look for. But I, I believe the this year's state budget and next year's state budget is is uh, is is make that more of a priority. Um, can you produce a list of these points? Yep. So Annette, to your point about a list of the points, refer special things to think about for fire and preparedness. Uh, I think what um, David Roast and John Mori put together. Uh, I read that uh, in its draft form, and I think that is a spot on document that covers a lot of the, the things that uh, the, a lot of the items that Geo and I've talked about tonight already. So I think that if we could share that document, that would be uh, really helpful. I believe you've already posted that to your PAN website. Um, Sonia says do a webinar for the general public too. We will consider that and, and look at doing that. OK, Daryl, be nice to uh, Derek. Be nice to Viochi. Come on. Uh, the uh, uh, Malcolm, uh, how does it says asks, how does the current fire danger fuel load in Palo Alto Hills compare to that in the CZU area? We seem to have many fewer fires on this side of Skyline. Um, I think really quickly, I would just say that the fuel load is similar. Uh, there, there's not that much of a difference between the fuel load on the uh, Santa Cruz side than than our side. Um, I will say that we have uh, a we have a team of city employ uh, uh, city departments that work together to uh, implement the the city's Foothills Fire Mitigation Plan, uh, which is a fire treatment program for the Palo Alto jurisdiction. Uh, on an annual basis, we do a number of treatments uh, in the uh, in the in the Wui area. Uh, and a lot of those are in and around Foothills Park. Uh, a lot of those focus on evacuation routes uh, using Los Trencos Road and uh, Page Mill Road. Uh, and we're uh, at times able to do some additional treatments of areas. But those are pretty small treatments compared to the broad um, Foothills area that we have in, uh, in the jurisdiction. And oh, by the way, you know, the Palo Alto uh, a jurisdiction is intermingled with all the other jurisdictions up there uh, to include unincorporated Santa Clara County. Uh, so even the work that we do in Palo Alto, you know, still we can be encroached on by fires from other parts, uh, fires that ignite in other uh, parts of the uh, Santa Clara County portion of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, but we do seem to have many fewer big fires, although this past season can real quick in 10 seconds or left. How many how many fires have we uh, small fires that we had um, in and around our jurisdiction this year already? 
Uh, it's in the dozens, of, and I'll just say real quickly, I, I went to two of them today, anecdotally. One was just outside the city limits of Palo Alto, near Alpine Road, somewhat off uh, from Arastadero. And then another one in our city limits that Engine 62 and Engine 66 responded to along with Highway Patrol. Highway 280 uh, between Page Mill and Alpine, there was a, a cigarette out the window most likely. So the other thing is the abstract idea of the total fuel load as Nathan was getting at, is less relevant than, hey, where is the fuel that's likely to be ignited? And a lot of these wildfire starts are within, let's say, 30 feet of a roadway for obvious reasons. So that's the short answer. Thanks. OK, great. And so the uh, I think the last. Uh, that was really the last uh, question and comment. Uh, you all can just look at the other com uh, the other comments that are in there. There are look to be uh, uh, maybe a couple of do outs that uh, Palo Alto OES will, will take on uh, from the uh, from the comments here. Uh, but at uh, with that, we're now at seven o'clock and I do want to keep this right to our hour. Uh, so. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation tonight. Thank you for your comments and your questions. I hope that you uh, you've learned a little bit more uh, about what was going on uh, with the the fires around us with what's going on in Palo Alto than you knew before. And uh, so thank you. Um, Geo 10 seconds to uh, to close to close out. Um, no, I just want to thank everyone for joining us, uh, clearly taking the situation seriously. And, um, you know, we're here for you. If you have any questions, you know how to reach the city, you know how to reach us, um, whether it's OES or fire department. So I encourage you to, you know, continue your engagement. Thank you for your the work that you're doing in the community as well. All right. And Ken, the final 10 seconds, I'll let you close this out. Good. Well, we're, we're posting lots of uh, thank yous in the chat, but uh, I just I want to acknowledge the uh, the fine work of our, our, our team here in the Palo Alto Public Safety rubric. Uh, we didn't have time to involve a lot of other players that are very much involved. Uh, law enforcement, public works, utilities, but I encourage those of you who haven't looked at our wildland fire mitigation plans uh, to go to the OES website. And, and if, if you want to really dig in on this stuff, uh, there's plenty of homework to be done and a lot of smart people out there. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for taking the time and thanks Nathan for putting this together. Thanks Geo for being a part of it. Have a great night, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. Good night.